long, long day. I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow, and I am Father Matthew Cowd, and we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Ten Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the street. Till I know I well, hello there. Hello. Welcome back to From the Rooftop. As per usual. It's good to be back because it's been too long. It's been too long. I mean, I think you have to always admit fault. We do. So, Well, some of us admit Oh, I want to admit your fault. Yeah, exactly. You've been very <laughs> difficult to pin down um, and to try to get you... It, it, this has been a recurring theme that's difficult for me, but um, in, in part it's true. That being said, it is nice to be back together and we are preparing as we speak for the athletic event of the year. What's that? Big ball. <laughs> this this uh, this athletic event, this particular sport, was born in upstate New York on Birch Lane, where I grew up. Birch Lane. Birch Lane. It was originally called Winnie Ball, short for Winslow Ball. Uh, we had the boys were all in their teenage years, and the girls were under ten, um, and so we had to have a family game and. Uh, we set up a volleyball net, but volleyball is not going to work when you have little ones and teenagers. And, uh, and for any girl who's more or less uncoordinated. I, <laughs> I feel com- offended because I know that was directed at me. <laughs> it's true. Unless, of course, you give me a badminton. That's true. And then that's where I shine. So the reason I say we're preparing for that is because we at St. Joseph have begun our new year. We are a month and a half in, hard to believe. And the hotel class, the new class, is doing wonderfully. Um, but they've yet to have an apostolic visitation from the Vicar General, Monsignor Patrick Winslow. Well, I so He came I'm this morning thrilled. for Holy Mass and is staying for a barbecue at the barn. And you promised me a good game of big ball. So big ball is like volleyball, but with a really large beach ball size bouncy ball and everybody it's a great equalizer everybody can hit the thing and it makes for a lot of fun it's wonky and you you see really athletic people like these guys who are really athletic suddenly on the level of somebody who's not athletic yes because it's really wonky it's hard to control that big ball it is and And your your greatest efforts at whatever you thought you knew about volleyball yeah they don't out the window yeah they yeah, because if all. you try to slam the thing, it'll yeah. take a hard left turn exactly. there. It just goes out of bounds. So when we say big ball, we're talking about a you know a, a five year old kind of ball, like a plastic ball, a blue ball, a red ball that's massive. Kind of like the the balls that people use to stretch on. Yeah, you know when they do their exercises. That's right. But <laughs> it's funny you said when other people do the kind of <laughs> yeah. That's self-revelatory right there. I've seen those things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've seen something like it. And um, except they're not so heavy, right? Because yeah. those things will break they're your light. Wrist. They're yeah. light. Which but, kind of brings me to a, you know, a continuation of a topic we had before relative to the virtue of play. And I've noticed it here. I, was, I notice it every year when we begin a new school year because um, one of the things that the boys do after some orientation time is that they, they have an immersion in the Latin language, in part to break down this mystique that Latin is somehow other than just a language. Um, It is the vehicle that has transmitted the faith for 2,000 years, that which the documents have all been written in, etc. And for large part, we dropped it. And the purpose of my making sure the men know it is not not so much relative simply to the sacred liturgy, but just their whole family history. But it has an, a secondary effect, which I find very solitary with the men in the beginning, is that you learned a language without the use of reason. You learned it when you were a child by just simple identification and response. And when you learn a new language, if any of you have ever done that before in a real immersion experience, you have to fumble around a lot and be willing to make lots of mistakes 
and you look like an idiot. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. Mm-hmm. It's like big ball for languages. Um, right. And it breaks down their sort of desire to present themselves as something that perhaps that they're not. As polished. As polished, or... as intelligent, as self-controlled. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our wonderful magistra, she's got people running around with rubber chickens and picking up <laughs> chairs and dancing and doing whatever else because you have to react to the command she gives you in Latin, et cetera. But it's, 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 it's interesting because it takes a long time to break down that sort of protective layer and make a fool of yourself. And big ball, you pretty everyone can do it because you, it doesn't, you, you cannot not make a fool out of yourself. Right. It's what and it you is. can't be that bad. Well, yeah, and, and it reminds me, of, you know, when our Lord says that we must become like little children mm. to enter the kingdom of God. And so those types of things, whether it's something silly like big ball, which is just a lot of fun, or learning language, it's in those humili- small humiliations yeah. that um, we become childlike. Yeah. You know, that's the great thing about a child learning a language or playing a game is they're just all in they're and all in. they're not entirely self-conscious. And usually they're not self-conscious at all until they start to become a little more reflective about how they appear in front of their peers. Right. But right. when you're when you're young enough, toddler and up, you, you're just showing up doing your thing. Yeah. And if you mess up on words, who cares? Yeah. Uh, um, and if you mess up in a game, you just usually demand that somebody change the rules. <laughs> you know? Well, and you know this, so to take it to the next step, just not talking so much about games at this point, but talking about how do we break down sort of our social fears um, in situations. You have been described by some as having no shame. Um, <laughs> now, what we mean by that is not that he doesn't have perfect shame relative to his own brokenness or sinfulness, or whatever else. He can go to confession like we all can. Um, and, we're, you know, we're all saddened, saddened by our failures and our sinfulness. I don't mean that. But you can't put Winslow into a situation and get him embarrassed. He always turns the thing. You always turn the thing. I'm talking to the audience more than you at this point. <laughs> you always turn the thing into some sort of a strength. No matter what you did that was foolish, whether you come back with something self-deprecatory or you pretend that what you did was exactly how everyone else should do it. <laughs> like everyone sort of falls in line and gets behind you and you become the sort of social hero of the situation. And it's great. Mm-hmm. It's a great gift. And I, I say that because... Again, I'm watching the men, and you know how it is when you're in a it's social situation, and all of a sudden, the person with whom you were speaking, let's just say they go off to get a, a, a bowl of chips that are laid out or whatever else, mm-hmm. and you're standing there by yourself. And I watch the men as the hands slowly go into their pockets, and they sort of turn toward the corner. There's that horrible awkwardness, awkwardness of, I don't know what I'm doing now, and I don't know how to break through... This show. Not everyone's sanguine, right? Some people have mm. just very introverted temperaments. Right. What sort of advice would you, since you are the master of no shame? Well, um, first I need to explain its origin. <laughs> so I, be careful. There's an origin explain. story. <laughs> <laughs> so um, where do you think I got this from? Oh. Oh, you know for a fact. Well, I just don't want to talk about the baby Jesus in the, the crush scene. <laughs> Um, you can talk about that if you want, but that's that might be too revelatory no, on no. both levels. I, well, that is a fun story, um, but that, that may be a little more um, uh, PG-13. Okay. But the <laughs> let's just say my pants, uh, when I bent over to put the baby Jesus in the crash, <laughs> alluded, it dropped we were, a little. I looked yeah. like a plumber. Yeah. That's the bottom line. I looked like a plumber. But. And for all to see... But in any event. Yes. But I whispered to him something like, hey, you know, this is happening. You should be aware of this. And he threw something out there that was so darn funny that it just broke the ice and no one cared. Probably something like, you're welcome. (laughs) Something along those lines. Um, Enjoy it while you can. You know, that sort of thing. (laughs) But I I get this from my father. Yeah. Is that what it was? Are you kidding? He's the most shameless. He's the only man who I know. That when playing a game and he's losing, he teases those who are winning. <laughs> who does that? <laughs> How is that even possible? 
And yet, and yet, somehow he finds a way to turn it around. So these men so, are going to find themselves, in, and as everyone that listens to us, yeah. find, find themselves in compromised situations, silly situations, because life is sort of silly at yeah. times, right? And you, you, you make mistakes or you do something stupid or something happens, you got to warp your board your malfunction, malfunction, yeah. Right? Or you make some noise or whatever else and things happen. Yeah. What's well, your advice? Well, first, I think, um, is just be a bit lighthearted. I, I think that's important. I think you need to forget yourself a little bit. On the other hand, I, I do honestly think about other people in the room. It's not, it's not as though I, I, I'm unfiltered. Um, I just have a wider berth of what I'm willing to say or do. <laughs> I, I think also in those situations, there's a desire for some levity to brought to be the, to, to be brought to the equation. There's some desire for another dimension into this atmosphere, especially if it's overly formal or um, and other formal events aren't great, but. You have to bring something to to layer into the formality that's just more human. Mm, mm. And uh, and so I see that and I read that the situation is requiring it. Now, if I'm at a funeral, that's sure. not going to happen, sure. right? Sure. Situ- have I been Situational tempted? awareness. You know, it's true. Absolutely. But I've been in situations where I've been in very somber situations where something really funny comes to mind. And I suppress it, <laughs> but I secretly want to share it with somebody because it's funny, right? Um, and I mean, maybe we've all been there, yeah, right? But yeah. you just know it's not the right moment. You got to read the room, as they say. Uh, and so I think it's part of it. I think with uh, growing older, you become a little less s- self-conscious. Wouldn't mm-hmm. you agree? I do. I think that there was a t- put it this way: our identities, by and large. You know, we don't we don't create them, despite what the world might say, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we we sort of inherit them. I inherit the genetics that I have. I inherit my family. I didn't choose any of that. Didn't choose where I was I was going to grow up, what land I was brought up mm-hmm. in, what language I speak. You know, as you get older, you begin to make more choices, but your identity, in in large degree, is is set by the interactions that you have growing up. So, how much do you identify with you know upstate New York? I mean, you can't get that out of you, no matter how hard I try. It's it's a fault. You mm-hmm. recognize it. Um, but- <laughs> well, you know, so much so, it's true. But it's I'm true. I'm go- I'm no, but I'm good at it. So, like, for example, when we were at uh, off of Lake Norma at the restaurant with mm. Father McCarthy visiting, this young lady. Um, yeah, you know she was in New York. Before she opened her mouth, yep. I said to the guys at the table, she's from Long Island. Not yep. just New York. She's from Long Island. Yep. And uh, uh, the and moment I, she opened her mouth. And I love that. Because you could see it. Right. There's something about the persona. And I love that. And I think that what happens is that's the way real life works. Yeah. Like you identify with a group and your your identification begins to shape your identity. Mm-hmm. The things you choose, the things you give yourself to, the people that are in your life. And a lot of those are a given. They're just a given. They're given to you. And then when you get older, if your character solidifies enough, the the new situation you're in your identity is significantly foundational enough that the new situation you're in, you're not looking for them to give you your identity. Right. You're not looking for them to give you sort of feedback as to who you are because they don't know you. Right. Um, it's like asking an opinion of someone who knows nothing per se about, let's just say, mechanics. Right. And you're asking their opinion. Well, their opinion means nothing because they don't know anything about it, nor do they know anything about you. So you're not right. looking to them to give you that that sort and of and yet feedback. we can be self conscious. We can be right? terribly self conscious because we give too much of our ourselves over for to another's opinion or view. And, I guess oh, and by the way, I was right. You were we right. You were right. She, she was, was up, she was from Long Island. Uh, yeah, I want to go on the record. <laughs> you were right. We did not <laughs> circle back to that. But yeah, I, I think also part of it is it isn't just about inserting yourself into a situation and bringing those elements to the dynamic, the social dynamic, but it's also about giving other people space mm. to mm. do so as well. Because we all know we've been around people who can dominate and it's tiresome. You know, yes. when you have one person dominating yes. a dynamic and maybe at first it was fun and good and it was, it served as, you know, as a social lubricant and it was interesting. But at some point when other people can't play, so to yeah. speak, it's overwhelming and it, it's just unpleasant. And so I think it's really important as much as you give, 
that you sit back and you take and receive and you be a part of that exchange. And it's a lot of fun because when you do open up space for other temperaments and personality types, you hear the funniest things coming out of right. coming out of the mouths of introverts or very That's dry right. comments that'll just have you slap in your knee. Yes, uh, and they're the yes. best. Yeah. Well, and they need, as you say, they need that space. Yeah. You know, Father Bittner is one of his favorite lines. Is one of his most famous lines is, "Have you ever heard of other people <laughs> <laughs> when someone's dominating a group, et cetera, et cetera?" <laughs> but I think of our own bishop. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's not the first one to speak in a group. He right. listens a lot. And whenever we've been together in a large group, we're all throwing things back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And if we just give him usually a little bit of space to actually speak, what he says is always insightful, profound. And oftentimes um, witty. And very Quite witty. witty. And there's a lot of people like that that need that space to be able to um, to speak. And it's, I guess the reason that I've been thinking about it is number one because of the new class and I'm watching their awkwardness. Now they're so solidified as a class mm-hmm. that... <laughs> <laughs> which is so they're typical starting every to become year. natural. They do, but yeah. they like they move in the group now. Oh, I see. Like okay. a flock. Yes. And um, the other day, I was in the kitchen in the refectory, and we call kitchens refectories here because it's where you get refreshment. Um, but I'm over at the at the coffee uh, stand, and I'm getting coffee, and they couldn't see me, and I hear them coming in one by one, marching in, uh-huh. and they 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 get to the to the uh, to the island. And one says, and halt. He turns around and they all salute, whatever. I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> They're just playing. <laughs> they didn't see me. So once they That's saw me, like, oh, oh, hi, uh, hi Father. <laughs> were, so it's, it's yeah, one it's reason funny. I'm thinking about these interesting so Because they're connected now. Mm-hmm. They, they trust each other enough. They can be part of that group and everyone gets kind of a voice. Um, they've lowered their inhibitions. But then the same thing is true in the scriptures. As this is what kind of got me thinking along these lines, is that there are several instances in Scripture where someone gets something from our Lord because they made themselves heard. Where it was, for example, the blind Bartimaeus, right? Who is yelling out to the Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. And everyone tells him to be quiet. Like, why do they care? Mm-hmm. Why do they want him to stop talking? He's blind. Right. Like, why not let him speak? He can't see. Right. right? Or the woman that's coming up to our Lord asking him uh, to heal her daughter or the woman with the hemorrhage. or And they get rebuked by the apostles because they're trying in their own minds, I suppose, to protect the master. But the only reason that they get a gift from the Lord is because they push themselves despite whatever the, the, the mores were, despite whatever the... Um, the expectations were the people around them not to make a fool of themselves. They were willing to make a fool of themselves. Well, you know, in in that respect, that their insistence and willingness to make a fool of themselves is predicated on the notion that the person to whom they're appealing is good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and that, I think, mm. makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. Because you could see in each one of those scriptural scenes that you reference, the the presumption of goodness on behalf of the petitioner. Yes, and that's, that's true. quite different than people coming and just wanting something and making an insistent petition for something. But there is no predicate of your goodness. There's maybe sometimes just manipulation or sometimes insistence with with zero assumption of goodness. But in their case, they certainly it was at least clear to our Lord. Uh, yes, their 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 intention. It was missed by the apostles in some cases. And back to what you said earlier. Even the children come to him, right? And they try to stop him, right? And he says, "Let the children come to be, and do not hinder right. him, for it's just such as these the kingdom of God belongs." Yeah, it, it's a hard lesson to live. I mean, in so many ways, much of our faith. And I was talking to the the hotel class. By the way, they use the military letters system, right? That's what yes, you use? for every year. To identify the class. We're on our eighth year, so it's the so hotel, it's H, class. Yep. hotel class. So we'll we have to the switch hotels. something up when it gets to Romeo, I suppose. But. <laughs> <laughs> Call them the Romes. The Romans. The Romes. The Romans. <laughs> the Romans. Just a small thing there. Um, what was I saying? So you were oh. speaking to them this morning. Yeah. What else were we talking about? I got well, about with... social fear and the presumption of goodness. On yes. the part of the one your your interlocutor, if you will, they're willing to put themselves out there, 
because the presumption of the goodness of the speaker to whom they're speaking. Well, I've completely lost my thought. That's okay. Well, it might turn us that. in another direction. That, well, that, but that no, solitary. but there was. I had a really good thought. Oh, well, it's I'm lost. sorry. Well, while you're while you're coming up all with right. that, um, the corollary to all this that kept spinning in my mind was then speaking to the men, you know, about their devotions. Because there's an awful lot of ritual prayer that takes place in a seminary, as you might imagine, which is our highest form of prayer, right? That which is ritualized such that we can all do it together as a body, which doesn't really admit of lots of individual sort of gestures or actions or praise or speaking or whatever. And that's fantastic. It trains them how to pray. It assists us to pray as one body in whatever the ritual is, whether it's the highest form of the Mass or the Liturgy of the Hours, which we spoke about before, chanting, or the Rosary, etc. But I said to them, you know, we are, we're, we're rational animals. And as animals, right, you, you need to do things with your body when it comes to devotions. That's why we love processions. That's why we love going over to that statue, kissing those feet. And the, the, the sort of Mediterranean countries were a bit more free with that sort of a thing. And mm-hmm. I've always appreciated that being mostly Polish and German, um, but I always gravitated to their expressions, but didn't feel terribly comfortable doing that mm-hmm. until I got a bit older. Um, and I, I do love them being free uh, outside of the liturgical prayer, just to be devout, do things with your body. You'll never be too too proud to uh, and, and have social fear mm-hmm. to not do something with your body. Like go over to the statue where they kneel down if you want to. You want to go kiss that? Go kiss it. <laughs> right. You want to put your face on the floor, on the ground? Go do it. Which has been interesting because after I gave that talk, <laughs> I'm watching in chapel. And we have some interesting <laughs> expressions. <laughs> but really it's just funny. they're letting themselves be devout in front of the Lord, not caring who sees them. It's kind of like David dancing in front yeah. of the ark, right? There you go. That's a great example. Yeah. Just, yeah. you know, and then be, and being ridiculed. Yeah. I probably might put a. Put a, a, a tunic on. on or something. Well, I just I think I might stop it before well, the I dancing think we would takes all place. <laughs> a flag on a play there. We we do have some social norms and courtesies, um, but you know, although I cannot remember my previous point, yeah. you know, it'll be it'll come out at some point. Well, it's one of those pearls that's you know must it's be lost cl- to history. It's just back in the oyster. <laughs> it will find a new way to open. It clammed up. It clammed right up. But I did have a great conversation with the guys and. You can see, you know, how they're coming to be at, more and more at ease, and it's really a wonderful process to watch. And I'm I'm hitting it at increments, mm-hmm. whereas you're seeing it daily. Um, but it, it, as I said to these young men, you know, coming into the the seminary formation program in your late teens, early twenties, the assumption is that you are more mature than your peers. Because there's no way you can enter a program like this where that's not the case. Yeah. So for us, that's a given. So if we don't give you credit for being more mature than your peers, please know that we just assume it. Mm. And that we are everything we're doing after that, pushing you and helping you grow and develop and mature, begins with an assumption that is itself a compliment. Mm. That's uh, great. You know, for them to really kind of That's a great thing for them to hear it. from you. Mm. Yeah. And, it, you know, and it's... It's true, as you as you can see. Uh, it's great to see them let loose and be m- more comfortable in their own skin. Well, it's it's interesting the way that men work, right? I mean, we we gravitate toward hierarchies anyway. Um, hierarchies, hierarchies are built into nature, and not as a subject of suppression, but a kind of way of knowing where you are, and who you're following, and who's following you, and what responsibilities you have, et cetera, et cetera. Men just naturally create them. Like you, you watch them in the sports or whatever, or anything we do outside. They just they gravitate toward. All right, who's in charge of this and who's in charge mm-hmm. of that? And order. what's my responsibility? It's just order, right? Mm-hmm. As Saint Thomas said, it's the office of the wise man to order things. And it's been interesting this year because we have the new PPF, the program for priestly formation, mm-hmm. which requires us to have a priest that's just for them, in terms of formation, which has created another layer, because right. now we have Father Becker, and he's there, there, there. Um, they call him the Propo Pater, Propodidic Pater, the father. <laughs> so with half a dozen men. Right? Well, yeah, there's eight guys yeah. and, oh, yeah. and a priest. Um, and then, but it, it created another layer such that I'm in a different place than I was last year. Ah, so there's more I'm always down there doing the nitty gritty stuff, like washing your, you know, 
clipping your nails and making sure your shoes are, right. you know. But he's down there with strategic sort of formation conferences every week. And you're at the higher level. And I'm at a higher level just, just because it The way happened. it's ordered. So it's interesting when I say something to them now, um, it's taken differently than I would have made, maybe, maybe when I said past, it before. Because yeah. it, it's coming from a higher level for them. I see. And so when you come and say something to them, it's the same sort of thing. Interesting. Yeah, and, and so that trickles down to them with a, a great deal of effect. Um, I think, okay, I'm looking at the roster here. You know, he's the head manager. Um, the owner of the team is the bishop, but you're the head manager. And so if he says I'm, I'm, my batting average is pretty decent, I'm, i got some job security. <laughs> <laughs> So. <laughs> they were fantastic. That's and you're great. right. They're just a wonderful, wonderful. It is funny to watch them kind of walk around because you can kind of see with Father Becker that he's like, you know, the you know, the father duck or yep. mother duck and all the oh, ducklings yeah. following him in tow. Yep. And uh, he handles it so well. He's, no, he's doing great. It's he, been fantastic. fantastic. They're all like water off a duck's back for him. They just they don't seem to. Mm. They just all seem to flow nicely together, so it's good. Yeah. I wish you could. I wish people listening could visit the seminary and see uh, what it is that we see. Hopefully, we're painting a nice picture mm. for them to have a bit of a window. Through That's a good our point. Words. Well, before we go, I mean, one thing you can do just to get some glimpse into the life. Number one, please come if you want to come. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, we love visitors here. We've we've had a thousand visitors last year. Amazing. Uh, yeah. It was incredible. Number two, we have a great website. Um, That's a good point. Yeah. So it's uh, stjcs.org, stjcs.org, And on that website, you'll get to see an awful lot of interesting things relative to the interior life of the seminary and also a kind of a video that puts together a glimpse of our program here. And you'll get to see Father Winslow in that video. <laughs> and Father Cow. And Father Cow. And so. uh, yeah, together we're. And they didn't put the gauze in the lens when they took those. Unfortunately, no, we know we need those gels. <laughs> that, <laughs> the gels that uh, soften, everything, soften everything, give more shape, uh, more definition, definition to your cheekbones. Oh than, heavens! Than but there it is. So now. before we go, please uh, visit us, visit the website, um, and pray for the seminarians. My my final thought before we head off is that as soon as we hit September first. My mind shifted toward autumn food. Now, the <laughs> climate true. didn't shift because I mean, it was still hot down here. Right? It's true, though. But it gave me license. Yes. I mean, I'm about four weeks away from Christmas music. But <laughs> You're that far. <laughs> well, well, maybe. But, uh, I, you know, the autumn scents already. Oh, I, I made a bolognese the other day. Did you? Just because it's it was a autumn. slow cook. It's yeah. inside. You want your house to start smelling like food again. I made a like, soup. Yeah, that's it. That's a hearty it. pork uh, we've, sausage we've switched. soup. We have switched. Yeah, no, it's it's time. It's time. So I think uh, we have to kind of look at the uh, the seasonal foods that are available. Mm-hmm. And for for those who enjoy good food the way we do, do not underestimate the vegetables out there. You know, it's so often the case that everyone just looks at the proteins, you know, and looks at the dairies, but. The vegetables. I mean, what you can do with vegetables and the types of vegetables. I mean, it's extraordinary. The flavors that can bring together. I mean, mm. come on. I mean, re- just a medley of roasted vegetables <laughs> that you put together with some rosemary and garlic and oh, olive it's oil true. and salt Isn't it wonderful? and pepper. I mean, I'm those really roast- hungry. I, yeah. I mean, those are fantastic. <laughs> we got to go. We gotta yeah, go we got to go. go. <laughs> God bless you all. All right. Bye Bye-bye. now. Makes me wanna scream. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time. From the Rooftop. Anywhere.